So it's a, a real honor to have Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling back here at West Point. He's a soldier soldier who served a long and distinguished career in our Army. Plus, he's a former member of DPE. He's out in the Aquatics Committee, so you know he's got to be good. General Hurtling is a 1975 graduate of the United States Military Academy where he ex excelled as a cadet and a core squad swimmer. On graduation, he was commissioned as an armor officer. General Hurtling has served in a variety of career, or a variety of uh, duty assignments over 37 years, both operationally and in the training environment. He served and commanded at every level from platoon up to field army, and he has led uh, training at the, uh, both the CTCs in the US and the Joint Multinational Training Center in Germany. On 9-11, he served as the Chief of War Plans, the J-7, on the Joint Staff. General Hurtling spent over three years in combat during his career. He was the Assistant Division Commander of 1st Armored Division in Baghdad from 03 to 04, and later he commanded that same division uh, in Germany as they prepared uh, for the 30,000-strong uh, Task Force Iron as they went back to uh, northern Iraq from 7 to 9 for the uh, surge. From 2009 to 2011, General Hurtling commanded the initial military training responsible for the initial training of over 160,000 officers and enlisted soldiers uh, who entered the Army from 27 installations across the uh, United States. He led significant change in both how we train soldiers and how we revise our Army uh, warrior tasks and battle drills. He introduced the Soldier Athlete Initiative, which has directly impacted every one of us sitting in here. It's the new Army Physical Readiness Training as well as if you take a trip to any mess hall in the Army these days, you'll see soldiers fueling with performance nutrition rather than French fries and onion rings. He retired as the Commanding General of the United States Army Europe and 7th Army, where he commanded over 60,000 soldiers and over 100,000 uh, Department of the Army civilian uh, workers and family members associated with those soldiers stationed throughout Europe. As the use for a CG, he led exercises in nearly every country in Europe and including uh, exercises with the nation of Israel. On a lesser important note, uh, when I was a garrison commander over in Italy, I served under General Hurtling, and he would do these commercials on the Armed Forces Network. And uh, he's a true believer in, in sport and fitness. In my favorite one, he's on a, a bicycle, a road bike with a sergeant major. He's all decked out in his kit, and he encouraged soldiers to get out and explore Europe, get some exercise by bike, but uh, see, see, uh, see Europe and get out of the barracks. So I thought it was pretty cool. More recently, you may have seen General Hurtling on CNN as the National Security, Intelligence, and Terrorism Analyst. Currently, he works as an advisor on the Global Strategy and Physician Leadership for Florida Hospital Orlando. He served on President Obama's President's Council for Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition. And he also is a senior advisor for several nonprofit organizations that help America's youth, deployed service members, and physically challenged athletes. And most recently, he authored a book, Growing Physician Leaders, Empowering Doctors to Improve Our Healthcare, which, by the way, received five stars on Amazon. So check it out. <laughs> sir, no, there's a lot of reviews, sir. <laughs> sir, on behalf of the Modern Warfare Institute and DPE, welcome uh, back to West Point. Okay. <laughs> what, what Colonel Bigelman didn't tell you is he's the only person in the history of the world that's ever complimented me on those Armed Forces Network commercials because <laughs> everybody hated them. Hey guys, first of all, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come speak to you about a subject that, that I know uh, and love, and that's the physical conditioning of our nation's youth. And I wanna thank especially the folks from DPE that are here and, and the people who are kinesiology majors because I think you'll see some connections between my time in DPE and what happened later on in my career when I was asked to do something uh, somewhat unique by the Chief of Staff of the Army and the TRADOC Commander. Um, so the, th that's a picture, and I'm sorry for it being a little bit blurred, but it was taken by a soldier of me and another guy. Anybody recognize the other guy? The guy with the sunglasses and the three stars? That's General Dempsey, okay. This is when General Dempsey was the acting commander of Central Command and I was commanding Task Force Iron uh, Multinational Division North in Northern Iraq uh, in a 15 month tour in 2007, 2008. Uh, General Dempsey, by the way, was not just my boss, uh, not just someone I admired greatly, but he also happens to be my best friend. And that relationship started <clears throat> when we were both captains living on Benedict Road here at West Point uh, in a duplex, or actually it was a triplex, the guy on the other side we didn't much associate with, truthfully. Uh, 
But they had, they, they were a young captain coming in. He was teaching in the English department. I was teaching in DPE. They had three kids. We had two, all of the same ages. And we grew together as a family, as young captains. And what used to happen back then is we would either mow the grass or go out for a run, and then we'd drink a beer on our back porch and talk about how the Army was all screwed up and we were going to, you know, if, if we were in charge, we would fix it. The bad news when you say stuff like that is eventually someday you might become in charge of the Army and have to realize that you do have to fix things that you were talking about before. That was our role then when he was the acting CENTCOM commander after uh, Admiral Fallon was re relieved, actually, by the president. And I was a division commander in northern Iraq. My chain of command went directly to him. During that visit, <coughs> which was in about the 14th month of a 15-month deployment, we were, actually that picture was taken in Mosul. We were doing a market walk. I was showing them how things were up and operational again. They've since kind of gone south uh, because of ISIS. But right after that picture was taken, he turned to me and says, hey, Mark, uh, I've just been told I'm going to become the commander of TRADOC. And he says, you've about reached the two-year mark in your division command. And he says, and I'm going to recommend to the chief of staff of the Army that you come work for me. I said, great. We had, we had worked together once before. When he was the division commander in Baghdad, I was his uh, assistant division commander in 2003 and four. And he said, yeah, but, and I was thinking when he said that, that he was going to ask me to command the Combined Arms Center at, at Fort Leavenworth. And what he said instead was, no, don't want you to do that. We're going to stand up something new. And he says, and I think uh, you're the right person to command it because of your background. So whenever you hear that from your boss, be skeptical. Uh, I said, what's the something new? And he says, well, it's, it, we're beginning an organization called Initial Military Training, IMT. He says, and I want you to be my DCG in charge of that. I said, well, what does it do? He says, well, you're going to basically command all the basic training centers, the AIT, all of new lieutenants coming into the Army, and all new warrant officers coming into the Army and do their introduction. I said, OK. He says, here's the thing. He said, There's, you and I have been, he said, you and I have been serving in the operational force for the last couple of years. We've been in combat a lot. He says, my take in my early assessment of TRADOC is we have some major areas of concern, and one of those is how we train young soldiers. He says, there's something wrong in basic training. He said, I don't know what it is, but I want you to fix it. Those, by the way, are mission orders. For those of you who are studying mission, order, mission orders in DMI, that's a mission order. Go someplace and fix something. Usually you have a little bit more guidance than that, but what he was asking me to do is make an analysis of what he thought was going to be problematic within uh, basic training. Three basic categories that he asked me to look at. The skills of our basic trainees, what they were learning in terms of war fighting. Now, this, is, this is, was about year four or five of our fight in both Afghanistan and Iraq. So at the time, this was also part of the surge, we were really getting a whole bunch of soldiers in. And in fact, if we were truthful with ourselves, we would, we would say that we were getting soldiers that probably should not have been in the Army. But compounding that problem of some of the soldiers that we were letting in, and I'll talk more about that in just a second, was the fact that operational commanders in the field were saying, train them on this and train them on that. And I've got this specific agenda I want you to train soldiers on in the training base. And by the way, change the way we do. So from a trade doc perspective, the training and doctrine perspective, we were getting a lot of influence from the operational force commanders saying, our soldiers were not prepared for the things they were seeing in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and we were four years into the war at this point, five years into the war at this point. The second thing we were having problems with was the inculcation of values. Uh, now remember during this period of time, for those of you that were in grade school or high school in 2007, we were having major problems with sexual assault. We were having the issue that you probably study in your history class about Abu Ghraib, uh, 
Uh, there have been some things that both our soldiers in our office, there's, there's a book called uh, Black Hearts about a platoon, some of you are shaking your head, about a platoon in the 101st, that were doing things that were unethical, immoral, and illegal in combat. What General Dempsey said was, I'm not sure how we're training the Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. So could you look into that too? And then the final area was something he termed attributes. And what he said was, I don't know what's happening, but it seems, it seems that our attrition rate is exceedingly high, primarily for the physical conditioning of our young soldiers. He said, I haven't looked in depth at the details, but could you look at that too and tell me what's going on there? Before I go on, I'm, I'm gonna just tell you some initial assessments in those three areas. First of all, in the skills area. The first, one of the first things I did when I got to Fort uh, Monroe, where TRADOC was at the time, I said, hey, I'm, I'm here to look at what we teach in basic training. Can you give me the program of instruction, what's called the POI? Every course in the Army has a POI. It's what you do, it's the objectives for learning and all that other stuff. So these guys trundled into my office with a couple of books, dumped them on my desk, and said, sir, here's the POI. I said, well, um, you know, it's a 10-week basic training OSIT. Basic training is 10 weeks long. What, what is our primarily key hours of instruction? They said, well, sir, we think that might be a problem because as we look at the POI, we have 797 hours worth of instruction in basic training. And if you subtract the amount of time that soldiers need to sleep, relieve themselves, have food, and just do personal items and training, they concluded they only had about 609 hours of training time available. So we were trying to shove 797 hours into 609. And part of that was the rationale of everybody in the field wanted us to do more things. But it was, it was a physics problem. You just can't get that many things into that few hours. So we started having to take a look <clears throat> at what we were actually training and why, and we did a complete revamp of the program of instruction over a period of about six months, where we actually pulled in a bunch of drill sergeants, a bunch of commanders, and said, let's fix this. So we did. And we eliminated some things, which truthfully, I took all kinds of heat for. One of the examples is bayonet training. Do, you, do we still do bayonet training here at West Point? Good, okay? Because the last time the US Army did a bayonet assault was like 1912 or something like that. And what we determined is we, we were spending 27 hours in basic training on the skill of the bayonet and stabbing little dummies and running through courses and stuff like that. And we never did that for real in combat. In fact, the AR-15 doesn't even have a stud to put a bayonet on if you wanted to do a bayonet charge. So we eliminated bayonet training in basic training. That caused a lot of old people from a cultural standpoint, the sergeants and the colonels out there, to say, this General Hurtling's a wild man, he's crazy, why is he eliminating the spirit of the bayonet? And if you've ever gone to the Infantry Museum at Fort uh, Benning, Georgia, they have a huge bayonet to welcome you into the building. So I took some heat. In the skills part, when I ask some of the key sergeants majors and the drill sergeants, what, how are we teaching values? Because we've got 18 hours in our program to teach the Army, the seven, the, the, the Army values. And they said, well, sir, you know, we really don't have time for any kind of classroom instruction or any kind of you know, engagement or exchange. So what we do is we just allow the drill sergeants to talk about values when they march guys to the ranges. How do you think that would work? There were about 750 drill sergeants in basic training about seven army values, seven times 750 times one hour apiece, you begin to see that there's no task conditions and standards associated with how you learn army values. So we revamped the army values program and, try, and did some things actually here with some folks at CAPE to try and get our army trained a little bit better on values so they could perform better on the battlefield. The third area is the one I'm gonna talk about now. And it was because, and I'll give kudos to the PE department, 
It was because of my time in, the, in DPE in 1984 through 1986 that I was able to take a, look, a hard look at what was happening with our nation's youth. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, okay? Two years later, this lady became, had become the first lady of the United States, and she wanted to come to Fort Jackson to see exactly what we were doing. And the commentary that we had uh, with regard to what we were learning about our nation's youth and what we were seeing in basic training caused her to start the Let's Move campaign. So if you don't think you can, you, you don't have an influence on national policy and strategy as an Army officer at any rank, you would be wrong. Because every once in a while you get the ear of someone important and you got to have your act together in terms of telling them how you want to proceed in terms of changing the culture. This is what I told her. Here's what we were seeing, because there was a big push at the time, the first understanding that's since understood by all, that we were recruiting this generation of people called millennials. They were the first ones in our training base. And this was some, these were some facts that we received out of research about these new recruits that we had. Now, things I would, <clears throat> and by the way, this is a slide we showed her. So I just lifted this and a couple other slides that I'm showing you. So you're getting the same briefing that the First Lady of the United States got. 85% eating fast food regularly. Tobacco products was not smoking as much as it was chula stuff. In fact, that 53% of using tobacco products, about 51% of those were smokeless tobacco as opposed to you know, puffing away. The, the tube time of both TV, computer, iPads, iPhones, averaged out to about, and this is 2009, by the way, averaged out to about 60 hours a week in front of a tube when you do the math. Let me say that again, 60 hours a week. And that's not homework stuff. <coughs> that's mostly entertainment and gaming. Soda was the primary beverage. You'll see where this plays a part later on. Uh, and milk had been sort of replaced by energy drinks across the board. Now, the last thing that I told her is that these kids are smart. They're much smarter than my generation of baby boomers was. But we have a baby boomer in command. We have X and Y generation folks as drill sergeants. And we have millennials as new trainees. And that's a recipe for disaster. Because I was commanding folks to do stuff. The drill sergeants who were the X and Yers were saying, we're going to beat it into them because that's their culture of making stuff work. And you got to be as good as me. To a bunch of young people who were the millennials saying, we're smarter than you. And we'll do it for a while, but then we'll give up. So our attrition rate was very high. Those were the key areas. Now, what I'll also talk about here is since I had taught in the PE department at West Point in 84 through 86, the majority of our states across the nation had eliminated PE in schools. That started in about 1992, okay? Today, currently, right now in 2017, there are five states in the union that have some type of mandatory PE. 45 states in our union have no mandatory requirements for physical education. Is that surprising to anybody in here? Prior to that, they had also eliminated this goofy course called home ec. Now, for those of you who have ever heard of home ec, that was where you used to teach girls to cook, sort of. But it was also the place where you taught nutritional value of food and how to maintain nutrition. The value of our food, many of you have seen the movies about what's in wheat, what's in uh, rye products, the kinds of things that are grown into rice, the kinds of soy and, and nutrients that are pushed into different kinds of food. That all started happening in the early 1990s. So this was the nutrition piece that was going on. The, the play piece was probably the most disconcerting because that 60 hours of tube time had replaced all the time you spent outside playing, doing whatever. It doesn't have to be organizational sports. It can be tag, hide and seek, whatever, being played outside on a sandlot, 
Okay, so PlayStation had replaced Play. Other factors, and there's about a hundred of them, and I won't go through this, were affecting the obesity level of our young people. There literally were a hundred. The, the elimination of smoking, the fact that most of our kids didn't smoke, that actually contributed to increased weight gain. The introduction of air conditioning in the South, in an area which we'll talk about in just a second, also caused people to stay inside more. So that contributed to a lack of play. Hell, I live in Florida right now. And I can go out on my street, and, there are, and it's a beautiful day, and there are no kids outside. The neighborhood I grew up on, admittedly I'm an old guy now, the neighborhood I grew up on on a nice summer or spring day, everybody was out doing something. That doesn't happen on our nation's streets anymore. When we first started getting kids into basic training, uh, part of the analysis was this chart. This was the Army PT test that we give on the first day of basic training, very first day. When they come in, they get their uniform and all that, the first thing that, that new recruits do is take a PT test. And you can see the failure rate is up around 60% for females and about 40% for males. But it started, now this is again 2010 when I was showing it to the first lady. But when I got this chart, I said, what, what happened in 2004? to cause this? Is it, we were given a different test? Were the drill sergeants taught to be more rigorous? What was going on that was causing that sudden increase in that curve to cause the failures in basic training? And after we studied this for a while, we realized it, it didn't happen in 2004. That was instead the first generation of youth entering the military that had grown up in the 1990s. So supersizing was invented by McDonald's and Burger King in 1992. The increase of Coke and soda started in the early 90s and completely replaced milk by the late 90s. Uh, all these food products that were having the different effects, the tube time, air conditioning introdu introduction in the South, elimination of smoking, and all the other things that went along with obesity, all started back in a, about 1994. So we were getting, in basic training, you will be getting as your soldiers, this generation of youth <clears throat> that has done very little growing up. Here's, now BMI isn't always the best measure of obesity and people being overweight, but in 2010, this was the percentage of people we were accepting into our army because we had to. And oh, by the way, one of the things I didn't mention early on, and you've probably heard this statistics before, one of the things that floored Mrs. Obama was we could only accept about 23% of our nation's youth into the military because 77% were not fit to enter because of one of three things. Either they didn't have a high school education, they had some kind of legal issue during their grades, you know, an arrest of some type beyond a misdemeanor, or they were, over, they were obese. So we made some leeway for the ones that were just slightly obese, but the majority of the kids that showed up at our door in the recruiting stations could not come in because they were too fat. I mean, I can't put it any other way. Now, some of you have probably seen this chart. I've got to run this. Can you, let me, take a look. This was, before I start the button, this is the United States in 1985. This is a, a, a product of the Center for Disease Control. And what you'll see is the majority of states had no data or were less than 10% level of obesity uh, 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 below the 35% the, the mark. Okay, Go, can you play that? Watch what happens over the age, and you'll see across the top the timelines. That's where we stand today. You can see the average in a couple of states, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and a few others was way beyond the 
that were greater than the obesity. The, the average youth between 18 and 24 was in that category. Colorado, which had been the best state in the union, is still the best, but by the way, the majority of their kids are between, fifth, between 15 and 19 percent of their population are above 35 percent BMI. Does that scare you? As future commanders of these soldiers, as leaders of these soldiers? If it doesn't, let me show you just, if you take from about New York down around the East Coast through Texas and into Arizona, that's where the majority of our recruits come from. Why? I, I don't know. Is it that they're more patriotic or what? I don't know, but that's where, that, they call it the banana belt in recruiting command because it looks like a banana. They focus their recruiting effort on those states because that's where most of the population is that would have a propensity to join the military. You starting to understand my problem? It's not over. One injury. An injury, and, and I asked for some data from our researchers. I said, I said we're, we're allowing not only the folks who don't want to serve as a couple of weeks in basic training to quit, but we are seeing an incredible injury rate. What are we doing wrong? So after watching how PT was conducted and seeing how things were going on early in the morning with combatives and the runs and all that other stuff, I said, you know, this is PT the way I know it. In fact, it's better PT than what I saw in the operational unit. What's going on? <clears throat> what was going on <clears throat> is all the kids that had entered the service who were not only overweight but had not played, had not done the kinds of things that you in the kinesiology and DPE world know, they had not closed their growth plates. So their bone density was incredibly bad. It, bones weren't breaking, they were shearing. And there were a number of injuries that we were most concerned with. This was the most important, it's called the femoral neck stress fracture. It, it, you can tell me who, it, who knows what that is, but it's where the hip bone connects to the leg bone and that little ball and joint that's in there cracks. It's not a break, it's like, it's like taking a crack in concrete and pouring a little water on it and letting it freeze so it expands. It's a debilitating injury. And on one base, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, this used to be a female injury because of leg gait when you were running. They would stretch out and their, their pelvic girth is wider, so you have a wider uh, uh, girth in a female. So as they would stretch their leg out, the pressures on the, the, the neck strap the uh, femoral neck uh, stress fracture would occur more readily. What we were seeing is this was happening in both men and women now. And it was a result, again, of weight and poor bones. Here's the deal, though. This is one of about 20 injuries we tracked. It was the most expensive because for every single one of those, it cost between $200,000 and $300,000 for our doctors to fix it. So do some quick back of the envelope math. In 2009, at one of our five basic training locations, we had 135 of these people, times 300,000. That doesn't come out of health care. That came out of my budget. And this is just one of 21 injuries we were tracking. So you could see that as a commander being charged with the health of my soldiers, I had to provide doctors medical equipment to treat these kind of injuries. Dental readiness. You can't see, I'm sorry for the white on there. In 2000, our category three and four new recruits was at about 31%. By 2009, category two, three and four, the ones that could not go to combat, was about 66%. Two thirds of our new soldiers had some type of teeth injury or teeth issue primarily caused by energy drinks, soda, and bad food, okay? Now you say, why do I care about teeth issues? Because the commanders in the field were telling me, don't, we're in the middle of a surge. We're taking your new soldiers and going right into combat with them, and we can't take a soldier into combat if, it's, if he or she is category three or four. So please fix them in basic training. Now, this is anything from bridges to root canals to full dental repair, which if any of you have had any of those things, know that they take a lot of time. So every hour you take out to fix teeth, you're taking away from the rifle range. 
Is this a readiness issue? You bet it is. I had young soldiers, young recruits, in the dental chair longer than they were on the rifle ranges. Because if they reported to their unit with, in a category three or four, they were not allowed to deploy, and I was no good to the commanders in the field. So what we did about it is, Colonel Bigaman said, and, and this is close to being the end of my presentation, and we'll talk some questions, is we created a couple of things, and it was hard, because it was culture change. We created the first thing was called the Soldier Athlete Program. We said to our young soldiers, hey, if you're going into the combat, you're the equivalent of a world-class professional. And you got to perform like a professional. So if you're performing like a professional, you got to train like one, you got to eat like one, and you have to sleep like one. Again, who's been to basic training? How much sleep do you get in basic training? Not a lot. Not a lot but you're getting more today than you were back then. Okay, so all those things compounded will cause a breakdown of the human body. We also completely revamped and introduced PRT. Now, I don't know how you all feel about PRT. I personally think it's a pretty good workout program. But more importantly, it was something that we needed because our old PT program was contributing to the breaking of soldiers it caused some of the injuries we were seeing. Now, okay, let's, let's talk real world versus philosophy. The philosophy of let's introduce something called PRT to reduce the amount of injuries we had versus we had a reporter from the New York Times by the name of Jim Dow come down to spend a week with our basic trainees. And he wrote an article. In fact, it was the article that got Mrs. Obama to come see us. And the title of the article, I'm going to put, your, put you all in your soldier role now and tell me how you would react to this title on the front page above the fold of the New York Times. Army changes from calisthenics to Pilates and yoga. That was the title of the article. You can look it up if you want. How would you react to that as soldiers in the Army? Say again? You'd be, upset. You'd be upset. The bad news is that's sort of exactly what we were doing. Now, we weren't calling it Pilates and yogas. We had a lot of stretching. We had a lot of uh, uh, time drills, fartlek training, the kinds of things that good coaches will tell you to do. But you can imagine the fan mail I got from the old sergeants and the old colonels who had been retired for a couple of years. That was in top, by the way, it came about three weeks after the bayonet story came out. The second thing we did, oh, I'm sorry, in the fueling the soldier, what we created in all basic training brigades was something we called muscular skeletal action teams. We combined physical therapists with athletic trainers with doctors and put the doctor in charge at each brigade. Now, I don't know if you know the culture of physical therapists and athletic trainers, they hate each other. Because one is to prevent injury, the other one is to treat them, so they take away business from one another. Pulling that team together and putting them into brigades, and I'm being a little facetious here, was a hard thing to do and it was a cultural shift, but those folks would watch soldiers, prevent the ones from getting hurt that were doing things that were stupid, and at the same time rapidly treat them so we didn't have multi-million dollar injuries. That was all under soldier athlete. Fueling the soldier was the hardest part. Um, who, anybody here a St. Louis Cardinal fan? Good. Tell me about Matt Carpenter. Okay, he's a baseball player. Do you know any of his history? Okay, his, his history is such that he played at TCU, played baseball at TCU, and every day before practice, his, he would come in with a couple of Big Macs, uh, a supersized fry, and a chocolate milkshake. And his coach one day told him, hey, Matt, you got some, as they say in Boston, <laughs> wicked skills. If you want to play professional baseball, the only thing that's going to hold you back is your diet. You got to give this food up and eat right. And if you talk to Matt Carpenter today, he will tell you that what put him on the road to being a, a National League All-Star was the fact not that he improved his hitting. His hitting was always good. It was that he changed his diet. If you are a Cardinal fan, you will also tell me about Matt Adams. Tell me about Matt Adams this year. 
Okay. Oh, man, you're not much of a Cardinal fan. You're not a fanatic then. Okay. All right. Matt Adams was the first baseman for the Cardinals over the last three years. They called him Big Country. Huge guy. Probably weighed about 280 pounds as a first baseman. Way too fat to play. And he was in the position of losing his job this season. So he took a page out of Matt Adams or out of Matt Carpenter's book and said, I got to lose some weight. He lost 50 pounds in the offseason. He's now one of their superstars again. What we realized we had to do is the same thing in the Army. And we only had for basic training 10 weeks to do it. So one of the biggest culture shifts we made was completely revamping all of our dining facilities. We eliminated all, you ready for this? And most of our dining facility or most of our basic training sites are in the south. We tore out all deep fat fryers. Does that mean anything to any of you? That means no fried chicken, no french fries, no onion rings, unless they were baked. We took the big glass canisters, which I'm sure all of you have seen when you visited different army posts that were filled with Danish and chocolate and fruit, and uh, not fruit, but uh, bad desserts, and we took them all out of basic training and put fruit in there, diced fruit and all those kind of things. Now, I could do this pretty easily for two reasons. Number one, I was the commander. Number two, when you're basic training, you don't have any place else to go. You go to the dining facility. That's it. So for a 10-week period of time, I had these kids <coughs> under my control. And we did some research studies and found out some magnificent changes in body composition, their capability to train and learn, and some real improvements in their body fat. <laughs> we had, uh, you know, there, there's, you say, well, that, how hard is that to do? It's real hard. Because when you talk about changing dining facilities, you have to talk about train, changing what food you order. And the arm, Army pays about $3 billion a year just for food for you all, okay? And they're all under contract. And there's a lot of Crisco oil involved in that contract. So when you start eliminating contracts for different things that are high in fat, even lean meats, it's radical. But I had the help of the Army G4, and he said, you want to do this, General? I'll help you out. So we did it. Um, the hardest part, I want to know the hardest part? Soda machines. When you go into the dining facility and you got the Pepsi machines, we've got a huge Pepsi contract, notwithstanding Kendall Jenner right now. Uh, but what we said was we've got to eliminate carbonated soft drink beverages because that's the key contributor to people being overweight. The Pepsi contract would not allow us to do that for two years. So I had a really smart sergeant major at Fort Benning, Georgia, when I went into the dining facility one time. And all of his soldiers, all the infantry soldiers, were going to the, the flavored water machines and bypassing, from what I could see at a distance, the soda machines. I said, Sergeant Major, how'd you do that? I said, did, did you guys eliminate your contract? He goes, oh, no, sir. He says, Sergeant Major. I said, what do you mean? He goes, come here. So we went over there. We went to the machine. And there was a out of order sign on the machine. <laughs> and I said, is it out of order? He goes, no, you want a soda? I'll get you one. And so he put, put it, and sure enough, the Pepsi came out. I said, well, he says, sir, if you put out of order on there that the new recruits don't know any better, so they're going to go, oh, OK, and then go over to the water machine. So this guy was nefarious enough to do that. <laughs> this is being filmed. I shouldn't say this, but because uh, it's a violation of contract. But what we just told all our brigade commanders, put out our order machines, or out our order signs on all the machines. It worked for a long time. <laughs> but that's sometimes how you have to use insurgency skills to get through <laughs> some things. I learned that in combat. Um, then the final thing we did, and I was talking to Major Spencer about this, this was in 2010. We designed an Army PT test that actually tested the skills we were supposed to use in combat. And it is one of my biggest failures in the Army. We could not push that through. You know why? Take a guess. Take a couple guesses. Say it again. I'm sorry? Um, no, that wasn't the case. They, they didn't try it. Money. Uh, no, it was actually cost. Cost was not an issue. How so? 
Now, our, one of our priorities for building the test was it can't take any equipment. We could, and we had to do it anywhere, in, in the field or in a garrison environment. And we, the new test had both those things. Sir, I was going to say, the, uh, getting back to the people that are running the test, not wanting to give up what has been standardized through so many years, uh, introducing something new would be... When you say running the test, who are you talking about? The sergeants and well, stuff? Yeah, that's sort of it. Yeah, here's the thing all of you are going to run into. In the Army, everyone, all of you, believe you are experts in leadership and PT. I know how to do it better than you do, just because I'm a colonel or I'm a major. You know, when you start asking people to give you definitions out of the ADRP 6-22, which is, yeah, what is it? It's the leadership manual. How many of you even knew that? How many of you have read ADRP 6-22? Okay, that's sad, but it's a representation of the rest of our Army. So if you don't know what our attributes and competencies are in terms of leadership, three and three both, and you don't know how they're applied in an influence take, technique, and you've gone through West Point and you don't know how to do it, you're going to learn an awful lot firsthand from your sergeants and your commanders who don't know what it says in our own Army doctrine. The same is true in PT. Why should I do a new PT test when I've been maxing push-ups, sit-ups, and the two-mile run all of my life? I'm in shape, so I'll just keep doing what I've been doing, and everybody after me will keep doing what they're doing. Although the Army PT test has zero relevance and no correlation to what we ask soldiers to do in combat. None. Zero. Now, am I being a rebel here? Yes. Because I believe we probably should have replaced the PT test about 30 years ago, but we haven't yet. We're still studying it. That's where you guys can change your culture, but there's ways to do that. So of the two of the three, I, I did okay. I'd give myself a good grade. On that last one, we failed miserably. So here are my, this final slide, my lessons. One of the reasons when I left the Army, I joined a, a hospital and a healthcare organization instead of a defense contractor was because I think we're facing a health crisis in our country. We see the debate on Obamacare or the AHCA and we just look at it having to do with insurance or how we pay people to get fixed when they're in the hospital. It is not. It is our nation's health. And you all as soldiers will experience this because it is about to become, if it hasn't already, a national security crisis. In World War I, we had to recruit two million soldiers for General Pershing in order to get about a million and a half. 500,000, or about a quarter, were not fit to fight. Most of those were not fit to fight because of disease, like venereal disease, believe it or not. Biggest reason why people didn't get into the Army in World War, II, World War I. In World War II, it was 50-50. So 50% of our young people, and by the way, in World War I, part of the outcome of World War I was to establish the ROTC program, primarily to get people in shape. That was the reason we created ROTC. In World War II, 50%. We had to recruit a million. We had to recruit two million for every million we got. Again, disease, lack of fitness, inability to fight. Today, that percentage is 2377. If you looked at that chart that I showed with the rotating fat guy, indicators if we don't change something that is by 2030, we will have less than 10% of our nations used to recruit from. And if some of the other measures come into play, like what's going on in New York State right now with free college education, it's going to be even less because you're going to be competing with, with a much smaller pool for when you're lieutenant colonels and colonels by 2030. I'm not trying to say there's a bad future ahead, but unless we start turning this around, there's a bad future ahead. What is our defense budget as part of GDP? Who knows? 
come on, it's been on all the news with the NATO discussion. It's about 4%. It's about 3% of our GDP is spent on defense. Healthcare, 19% of our GDP, and it's going up to about 25% within the next five years. So we are going to be spending a quarter of our produced money on trying to keep healthy. That scares me from a strategic perspective. And it should scare all of you. So for all of you who are in the kinesiology program, you will have a job in the near future. Um, there's ways to model these things and to lead these things. But primarily, I would suggest, you know, the Army came out right after we did our thing. General Horaho, who's a good friend of mine who used to be the Surgeon General, started the, the Army, um, what's it called? What's it? Yeah, but, yeah, but it's called something. It's a perform yeah. performance triad. Yeah, that's the phrase I was looking for. So sleep, nutrition, and exercise. We're the only, I will tell you, being in the private sector now, we're the only organization in the country that's doing those three, other than my hospital, which just started the sleep part of it. Everybody else is worried about diet and exercise, diet and exercise. But mental health, sleep, outlook, interpersonal relationships all contribute to your ability to perform, and we don't pay enough, enough attention to them. So those are the things you can do. That's my message. It all started here in 1984 when I was a PE instructor because the cadets we saw then are not the cadets and the youth of our nation that we see now. I'll stop talking now and ask for any questions. What do you got? Is it hot in here or is it just me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sir, Cadet Radcliffe, D3. Um, in high school, sir, I would go to a basic training, I mean, not basic tra training, um, a recruiting office with my best friend to help her prepare for basic training. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, sir, if you ever looked into improving or, st or um, establishing like a program within the recruiting offices that help prepare, physically prepare um, the soldiers prior to entering basic training. Sir. Yeah, and, and yes, we did. And we had it when I first took over IMT. And what we were finding is we could not, in a program that was conducted in a recruiting office, counter the activity that was going on or that wasn't going on in the schools and the homes. And it was costing us an extreme amount of money. I just couldn't afford it. You know, it, it's one of these kind of things a lot of people say, well, you know, the Army does it. In fact, that was the first thing Mrs. Obama says. The Army does it so well, how do you transfer it to the rest of the nation? And I said, we don't, you do. Figure it out. Um, yeah, and, and I actually got in, tr I didn't get in trouble. I, I said to the First Lady, I was literally in my last week in IMT. I was getting ready to go take command in, in USERA in Europe. And she said, oh, General Hartling, this is terrific. Thank you so very much. Uh, I need you to help me with this Let's Move campaign. I said, ma'am, I can't. I'm going to Europe. It's nice knowing you. See you later. I said, I've got, and by the way, the Army is 1% of our nation. One percent of our nation's youth is wearing uniform. Ninety-nine percent are not. So I said, I can't help you with that ninety-nine percent. I just don't have the funding. You and your husband have to figure that out. So, so when I retired, literally I was on a beach in New Smyrna, uh, Florida. Phone call ran. Mrs. Obama wants you to be on the President's Council for Fitness. So yeah, my smart acidness got <laughs> bit me in the butt. Um, no, you just can't solve the problem by having small things at recruiting stations because what I will tell you is recruiters do it on their own. And they'll have workouts two or three times a week. It is not enough to counter the societal norm. This is a societal issue. This isn't an army problem. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sir, Cadet McCormick, uh, Company I3. Just out of pure curiosity, what did the APRT program consist of that you invented? It, it was a five-event test. There, actually, it was two tests. Uh, one was the typical four-score APRT, 
And it, it consisted, I don't want to go into the details, but it consisted of, <laughs> truthfully, if you, General, General Dempsey has an expression uh, that I use a lot. It's, if you want a new idea, read an old book. The new five-event APRT was a lot like the five-event APRT that was in existence in the 50s and 60s. And it was pull-ups. Um, that's why we have so many pull-up bars around the Army now, because of, we thought it was going to go to that. It was a, like a crab walk run. I can't remember the name of it. This was too long ago, and my mind's going dead on me. It was a type of sit-up that was not a sit-up. It was a run, but not a two-mile run, and something I can't remember. But we had that test, but we also had a combat test where you could take all the things you would find in a normal supply room and make out a course on a football field or any kind of level field and just do it for time. And it was an anaerobic event, much like the IOCT is. The IOCT, by the way, for those of you who hate it, who hates it? OK. It is literally the best test of physical fitness in the world today because it, it tests anaerobic capability. <laughs> that, that was not an advertisement, but you guys can pay me later. OK. Um, it, it tests all the things you want to test, especially those related to the kinds of things you do in combat. It's, ex it's directly related to any skill that I saw soldiers perform in combat. But you have to make a gradual transition between the three event, which is relatively easy and people pass, to one that might be a lot tougher that tests things that they don't normally use. We did a rollout of the new PT test at Fort Jackson uh, with a bunch of reporters and a bunch of uh, folks from AUSA. And the there were a couple of reporters that actually did it. And they, they all you know, came out saying, we've never experienced anything like that before. It was hard. So a lot of older, let's just say older, more portly soldiers in the rank of officer and sergeant major didn't want to try it. It's unfortunate. What else? Anything else? We've got time for one more question. One more. One more question. Two more. Three more. Two more. All right. Three Go more. ahead. You just raised your hand because you didn't think you'd be called, <laughs> didn't you? Okay. I, I know the deal. I was a cadet once. Go ahead. Sir, with the new physical fitness test or the combat readiness test, yeah. do you think standards should be the same for everyone regardless of age or gender or like in order to promote combat readiness? No. I'm sorry. Uh, for the PT test, yes. For the combat test, no. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you're always going to get competition among certain cults and tribes in our army for certain things. And there, as a tanker, I had to do different things than an infantryman did, or an artilleryman, or a logistician, or a finance officer. I mean, there are differences. So I think you could, if you're going to, it depends on what you want to tie it to. If you just want to compete, it should be the same for everybody. And you should have a grade scale that does that. But the, if you have that grade scale that does that, it will cause problems. So you have to find a way, and I thought we did a pretty good job of it of tying combat skills to requirements, but also differentiating between, um, I hate to categorize, but combat versus non-combat skills. The problem is everybody's in combat. And you know, if, if you're, there are now going to be MOA, I think, what the chief is leaning toward, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm dated now, but I think he's leaning toward MOS specific testing. Is that right? I think that's a good idea. Because if you can't serve in the MOS, if you can't do the required physical skills in the MOS you want to serve in, you shouldn't be in that MOS. But that shouldn't pre prevent you from being promoted or doing something. If you want to serve as an infantryman, you got to do the things an infantryman does. There was somebody else. Somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. Sir, Dustin Fulkerson, DPE. Uh, my question had to do with the physical education programs in the country. You mentioned that um, 45 of the states, they don't require it, five do. When you spoke with Mrs. Obama, were there discussions or are you privy to discussions about 
trying to uh, energize states to bring those back into play so that yeah. programs are beefed up in some states that don't. Yeah, that's, that's an individualized state thing, and she realized she couldn't do anything about that other than shaming, which truthfully she did over the last couple of years. She, she started an organization called the Partnership for a Healthier America, where it brought a bunch of different people together into one group, and they were attacking the problem from different angles. Uh, physical fitness, nutrition, sleep, all. So there were all these agencies that were contributing, and they had a couple of conferences a few times a year. But as soon as you start messing around in the state's business, you get in trouble. And I'll give you an example. As, as part of the President's Council, they sometimes ask me to go to different legislature. When I used to be part of the President's Council, they would ask me to talk to senators and congressmen at the state level. The state of Florida, my state, which you would think, pretty healthy state, right? They got oranges, orange juice, sunshine, all those other kind of things. Yeah, not so much. There is no mandatory PE in schools in Florida. Now, they had a class up to about two years ago, and they eliminated it. Uh, and it took a vote of Congress. I went down there to try and influence the senators and congressmen not to take it out of their required courses in the middle school. And instead of having PT, they voted it out guess what they voted in to replace it because they were compressed for time? A computer course. I personally think the last thing we need to be teaching more of in schools, because most of the students know more than the instructors, is computers. So they've replaced that without an understanding of the second and third order effects of disruptions in schools, behaviors in schools, and all the research that has been done in terms of learning based on physical activity. I can't account for that. It's an uninformed representative body. Did that answer your question? I don't, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I mean, it, it, it's going to take parents speaking up. It's going to take more act. And the other thing it can't take, and Mrs. Obama was very aware of this, you can't shove it just into the schools. You've got to portray it in your role modeling in homes, too. This, is the 60, this year is the 60th anniversary of the President's Council on Fitness. So when I was a little kid and John F. Kennedy, and, and in fact, that was another outshoot of the 50-50 in World War II, you know, when Eisenhower became president, he said, I couldn't get enough recruits to fight World War II, so let's start this thing called the President's Council on Fitness. That's how it started. This is the 60th anniversary of that. What the President's Council is attempting to do is get more and more parental involvement and grandparent involvement in raising kids the right way. Okay. Yes, you got to cut it. Five minutes Let me get one more what? question was in the back, and then we'll stop it. We're going to make people late for the next class. That's too bad. Okay. Just blame it on me. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's, let's no, cut but, it. But we have this room until uh, 1450, so another 30 minutes for questions and answers. But we got to let people who have to leave. Okay, thanks everybody, really appreciate it. The, our kinesiology fac, uh, faculty, and most importantly, our kinesiology cadets, thank you very much for your insightful words. Sir, your, your shirt from the Sweet. 80s is probably old. Take this new one and okay. uh, work out hard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. All right.